Chapter 28, Head and Spine Injuries. As we already know, the nervous system is a complex network of nerves and cells that allow our body to function. This includes the brain, spinal cord, and several billion nerve fibers. The brain is protected well because it's encased in the skull. Spinal cord is protected, at least while it's in the spinal canal, but then despite its protections, sometimes serious damage can occur. The nervous system is divided into two anatomical parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Here's an illustration of both of those. Let's talk about the central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord. The brain, which of course controls the body, is the center of our consciousness and the supercomputer that makes us who we are. It's divided into three main components, the cer cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. In this illustration, we can see that the cerebrum, the largest part of the brain, is also further divided into four sections, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. In the brain stem, sometimes called the midbrain, and the cerebellum, those are our more autonomic nervous systems, uh, functions that take place there. The cerebrum co controls a wide variety of things, including our higher motor functions and our conscious thought. That's the part that makes us who we are. The cerebellum controls our balance, body movements, etc., and the brainstem controls the necessary things for life. The spinal cord connects to the brain and is a network of extended fibers that go throughout eventually the entire body. It carries messages between the brain and the body. The brain has a protective cover, kind of a thick cord with a shielding around it or a sheath, kind of like if you think about a cable TV wire. There's the outer layer, the dura mater, which is super tough, fibrous and then contains CNS, or the central nervous system. The inner two later layers of this are called the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. You can see here on this illustration. The outer layer, the muscle around the dura mater, the arachnoid space, called the arachnoid space because one of the doctors who discovered it thought it looked like spider webs so he called it arachnoid space and then below that we have our cerebral spinal fluid blood vessels and then the pia mater which goes around each part of the brain the cerebral spinal fluid is produced inside the brain in an area called the third ventricle primarily a shock absorber, but it also helps control the temperature of the brain. There are 31 pairs of cranial nerves or spinal nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The spinal nerves conduct impulses from the skin and other organs back to the spinal cord and then eventually to the brain, whereas the 12 cranial nerves transmit information directly to and from the brain. There are two types of peripheral nerves, sensory nerves and motor nerves. Sensory nerves carry only one type of information from the body to the brain via the spinal cord, whereas motor nerves carry information from the central nervous system to the muscles. 
connecting fibers are found only in the brain and spinal cord. They connect the sensory and motor nerves with short fibers and allow for this exchange of simple messages to take place. The nervous system works by virtually controlling all of the activities of the body, including reflex activities, voluntary activities, such as are consciously performed, getting up, walking, moving our, our hand, shaking hands, smiling, etc., and involuntary activities, activities that are not under our control, such as breathing and our heart beating. The connective nerves in the spinal cord form what's called a reflex arc. A sensory nerve detects that something is irritating or stimulate or stimulus, and it bypasses the brain and sends the message directly back to the nerve. For example, as we see in this illustration, with the hand over a flame, it doesn't have to process all the way back to the brain for us to reflex and move our hand. There are four major bones that make up the cranium, the occiput, the temples, the parietal regions, and the frontal region. The face is composed of 14 bones, including the maxilla, the zygoma, mandible, nasal bones, and frontal bones. Here we see that we have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccyx. Notice that from the sacrum to the coccyx that these are fused. Head injuries can be divided into two categories. A closed head injury, by its term, is closed. The brain is injured inside of the skull, the cranium, whereas an open injury often results from penetrating trauma, may have bleeding, may have exposed brain tissue. The brain is open to the atmosphere. Motor vehicle crashes are the most common form of MOI or head injuries. Other forms of MOI for brain injury or head injury are assaults, falls, and sports related injuries. This table illustrates some of the different things that we might look for when assessing a patient with 
possible head injury. Scalp lacerations, they can be minor or serious. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. These can be visually distracting because they bleed a lot. Small laceration can lead to significant blood loss, especially in children. When we remember the size of their head is disproportionate to the size of their, their body. Skull fractures may be categorized as either open or closed, depending on whether or not there's a laceration that exposes to the scalp. Signs of skull fracture include things such as the patient up head appears to be deformed. There's a divot where it shouldn't be. There's a crack in the skull. We might be able to see this with an open head injury. There's Ecchymosis or bruising under the eyes, we often call this raccoon eyes or battle signs, which are uh, blood pooling behind the patient's ear. These are good examples of both raccoon eyes on the left and battle signs on the right. Linear skull fractures account for about 80% of all the skull fractures and need to be diagnosed via x-ray or other imaging. Depressed skull fractures, often the uh, EMS provider will be able to feel this. That's why when we're palpating the head, we need to be careful that we don't uh, push in any bony prominence or fragments that may be um, exposed. The basal skull fracture is at the base of the skull. Notice it's at the uh, area just uh, even with the ear. Uh, the base of the skull or uh, cranium is actually about your ear level. It is possible for us to see cerebral spinal fluid draining. We could see raccoon eyes or, or battle sign with a basal skull fracture. Open skull fractures, sometimes resulting from trauma, blood force trauma, penetrating trauma, bullet wounds, etc. We'll see part of the brain tissue may be exposed to the environment or may be scattered uh, outside of the patient. The most serious of head injuries are what we call traumatic brain injuries or TBIs. They can be either direct or indirect. The primary injury results from uh, instantaneously from an impact to the head. Your head hits a concrete floor, um, we, have, we suffer immediate uh, injury to the brain, for example. Secondary injury might be less severe, uh, such as a concussion injury. The secondary might cause things such as, might be caused by uh, hypoxia, hypotension, cerebral edema, uh, in, intracranial pressure or hemorrhaging, increased pressure, infection, etc. TBIs can result from blunt or penetrating trauma. They often can um, have what we call coup contra coup, where we hit our head in the front, for example, we smash against the steering, the steering wheel or hit windshield. The brain sloshes and hits the back of the skull and we have an injury, a significant TBI to the occiput of our brain. Cerebral edema or swelling in the brain may not develop until several hours after the initial injury. Things to look at. Accumulation of intracranial pressure or increased ICP as it squeezes the brain against the bony prominence. That pressure has to go somewhere. The brain needs to go somewhere. One of the things that happens sometimes is uh, the brain starts to go down through the mag uh, foramen magnum at the bottom of the uh, skull. So we call this Cushing's reflex. We have abnormal respirations, ataxic respirations, a decrease in our pulse rate, patients complaining of a headache, nausea, vomiting, decreased alertness, bradycardia, sluggish or non-reactive pupils, Posturing to cerebit towards the core and a widening of uh, pulse pressure. 
The intracranial hemorrhage can also be seen by increased ICP. Unfortunately, we can't measure ICP, so we rely on our presentation of the patient and um, what the Cushing's reflex tells us about our patient. Between the skull and the dura mater, we can have bleeding there, or beneath the dura mater, but outside of the brain. So subdural hematoma would be beneath, and epidural hematoma or would be above the dura mater, and then within the tissue itself or intracranial bleeding. Here we see in this illustration the, the epidural hematoma as the blood accumulates above the dura mater on the outside, pushing on the brain, causing some damage, causing injury to the brain. Subdural hematoma underneath the dura mater. Similar effect. The way that uh, doctors fix this is they go in and they drill a hole, they put burr holes in, and they relieve the pressure. Intracranial bleeding, harder to fix. The bleeding, the bleeding is within the tissue itself and can be the result of a rapid deceleration force. Subarachnoid bleeding, so a below the arachnoid uh, space occurs or can occur as a result of trauma also. Um, one of the signs is a bloody meningeal uh, irritation. So CSF that circulates gets uh, contaminated with blood, uh, often uh, because of trauma or the rupture of it. Concussion injuries are considered to be a mild form of TBI. Uh, to keep in mind that uh, with recent studies, we have seen that these can be accumulative, uh, hence concussion protocols and um, sporting uh, activities now, uh, any contact sports, um, particularly high school sports, uh, if somebody's knocked out or has their, as I say, their, their bell rung pretty good, they may not be able to complete the season. Um, and then we see that with professional sports also. About 90% of the patients who do not experience a loss of consciousness, but that doesn't mean that they haven't gotten some uh, significant uh, injury uh, that they need to take a look at and uh, monitor. Some patients may become confused, might have amnesia, but usually this only lasts a short time. So anytime that there is a potential head injury or we have evidence of a head injury, we don't want to assume that just because everything is looking okay that our patient uh, doesn't have a serious head injury. Uh, we need to make sure that they get evaluated and uh, get uh, seen by a neurologist. Bruising to the brain is uh, more serious than a concussion, uh, of course, we know that bruising or contusion is, um, they've sustained a long lasting, maybe even permanent damage because part of the tissue is being damaged and bleeding and uh, blood outside of its uh, pipes. Uh, it's very irritating and caustic to the tissue around it and can cause injury. Some other brain injuries uh, are from medical conditions such as blood clots uh, or hemorrhages. We talked about these in our stroke lecture and neuro lecture. Uh, these are different types of strokes. Um, let's not get tunnel vision and that the patient didn't have this type of injury. Um, it could happen as a, as a result of a traumatic brain injury also. It could have a contusion, it could bleed, and then it could clot off and it could cause damage. Spinal injuries. Um, Remember, it's the large uh, structure that keeps us, uh, gives us our shape and our form. Um, and when we are within tolerances, everything is fine, but anytime force is exerted upon our body that can cause uh, damage to that, um, the spine is, even though it's protected fairly well, is susceptible to, uh, to damage. We can see a herniation of discs due to repetitive motion, maybe lifting incorrectly, um, or maybe lifting because we have to um, in certain ways, uh, especially in our job, uh, can cause damage to that. 
uh, motor vehicle collisions, uh, we've overextended our spine, we've twisted, we've rotated wrong, um, acceleration, deceleration, falls. So anytime the spinal column moves outside of its intended pathway, we call that subluxation. Um, hyperextension can cause spinal fractures. Uh, unnatural mo uh, motions can uh, result in uh, decreased neurological function or even uh, permanent deficit. That's not to say that every time somebody fractures a vertebrae that they're going to be paralyzed forever. It depends on what happens to the spinal cord inside of the vertebral column. But every time that it's insulted, that can put on pressure upon that spinal cord, uh, which could cause injury to that spinal column or spinal cord. So we assess our patients uh, look like we would with any other patient. What was the injury? Was it a motor vehicle collision, the, the MOI? Um, was a pedestrian involved in the collision? What, did they fall? Was it blunt trauma, penetrating trauma to the head, neck, or back? All of these give us a increase our index of suspicion for spinal. Acceleration, hangings, um, Axial loading, this is dive injury. Somebody dives off into a pool or a, a lake or something that's too shallow and they, they load their axis. Um, and then of course, diving accidents. So is it safe for us to be there? We always use our uh, standard precautions. We wanna make sure that uh, we've evaluated the indicators for this uh, mechanism. And what does that tell us about the potential injuries that we might we perform our assessment just like we would with any other patient. Sometimes with trauma, we might go a little bit faster. Um, find and fix immediate life threats, not to be diminished with the same with our you know, head and neck patients. We assess the spinal uh, immobilization. Um, we'll talk about how to properly um, position somebody on a uh, uh, immobilization device and when they are needed. Backboards are often placed on uh, people, uh, but not maybe done the right time or the right way. And we'll talk about that. Make sure that we don't get tunnel vision. Assess the chief complaint. Are they confused? Do they have slurred speech? Do they have repetitive questioning or called perseveration? Do they remember everything? And some of these things are not uncommon for our patients to get hit in the head and have short-term memory loss or ask the same question over and over again. If our patients are unresponsive, we should assume that they have a significant spinal injury and we should take necessary precautions to transport them with spinal precautions in place. If necessary, to maintain an open airway, use the jaw thrust maneuver as this provides the, the safest possibility of ensuring their airway without causing further damage. Are they breathing too fast, too slow, or not at all? What is their pulse like? Does it indicate a more serious condition underlying? Assess the patient for bleeding and symptoms of shock, cover them with a blanket and control it. And then transport the patient to the appropriate facility. Remember, that if we have to use lights and sirens, this may increase the patient's anxiety. Do our best to obtain medical history or sample history as possible. If the patient's not responsive, do what we can from other, uh, 
check what we can from other sources, bystanders, family, etc. What type of monitoring techniques and devices do we have? Are we going to use those? Do a full DCAP BTLS examination on our patient. Check for perfusion, pulse, motor sensation, and all extremities. Are they leaking any blood or cerebral spinal fluid? If so, treat them appropriately. What do their pupils look like? Are they equal, round, and reactive to light? Or are they unequal? Equal. Is one sluggish? Is one bigger than the other? Etc. Do our Glasgow Coma Scale record the levels of consciousness? Here's our GCS. Check the spine. Run our fingers down their vertebral, their column, looking for step-offs, con, uh, protrusions, contusions, anything that's out of the ordinary tenderness or whatever. Any soft tissue injuries that might also be along the way. Reassess, reassess, reassess with all of our trauma patients. Make sure that we're constantly reassessing them to see that our treatments are working. And if they're not working, why aren't they working? And change if necessary. Reassess at least every five minutes, more frequently if necessary. Communicate our findings to the receiving facility and make sure we document. Three general principles of managing a patient with a head injury. Establish an adequate airway. Control any bleeding and check for cerebral spinal fluid. And assess and continually monitor the patient's level of consciousness. As we manage the airway, what is the best way to do that? We maintain them in an inline, neutral position. Sometimes we have to place them on a, with a cervical collar or a backboard. Are we suctioning their airway if necessary? Are we giving supplemental oxygen when necessary? Notice in this picture, we have two rescuers, one at the head, stabilizing the head. The other one is placing the C-collar on. That person at the head, once she takes control of that head until that patient is secured and properly secured to a spine board, her hands cannot leave that patient's head. If there is no circulation, start CPR. We talked briefly about Cushing's reflux, Cushing's triad. So we have an increase in blood pressure. We have decreased heart sound or heart rate, bradycardia. And we have irregular or Shane Stokes respirations. If we see those things in the presence of a MOI that suggests head injury, we need to be um, weary that the brainstem may be herniating. Follow our standard precautions. ABCs manage the airway. Be prepared to ventilate this patient if necessary. Immobilize with a cervical spine. Never force the head into a neutral inline position if we can't do that. Leave it in the position we found it if it's causing too much pain or discomfort for our patient or we physically cannot move it. Back to this slide just for a moment. If we we're having to use the jaw thrust and our patient is unresponsive, consider placing an airway in this patient that will maintain an open patent airway for our patient and we won't have to uh, continually hold the airway open. 
Remember, C collars are not permanent. They just provide um, partial support. It's more of a reminder for our patient not to move um, for potential cervical spine injury that could be there. As we secure them to a long backboard or vacuum uh, mattress or other immobilization device, um, we make sure that we have enough people to do so. We roll them up on their side, we check their back, we place them back on the board, we secure them to the board so that they don't move. There's a giant splint. If our patient is sitting, um, theories today is if our patient is sitting and can walk around even in the presence of some spine injury, maybe we put a C-collar on, they can get up, they can sit on the cot in a position semi-fowler or so with a uh, C-collar on. Um, again, follow your local protocols. Standing patients, we don't really do this uh, standing backboard takedown anymore, uh, as I just mentioned. Follow your local protocols. There are many spinal immobilization devices. We talked about the uh, vacuum mattresses, uh, hard, rigid backboards, and then uh, scoop stretchers. Uh, these are all good devices to maintain inline uh, stabilization of the, both the cervical spine and the rest of the spine. Seated patients. Um, we will show you how to use this uh, KTD or best type um, immobilization device used for removing a patient from a car who cannot stand and get up and we're uh, concerned that they may have a significant spinal injury. The decision to remove a helmet or not is based on the type of helmet that we're removing. Football helmets, for example, if they fit well, and the patient is still wearing pads, we would do our best to keep the pad, the uh, helmet in place, um, but we could remove the face. Some things we want to consider if removing the helmet, um, is it making access to the airway difficult? Um, is the patient in cardiac arrest? Uh, is there too much? When removing a helmet, it takes at least two people to do so. And you should also always uh, consult medical control or refer to your protocols um, if you have any questions. Look at different ways of removing the helmet. Perhaps um, there's alternate alternatives um, that we can do to uh, reduce the motion. Um, some of these alternative moments, uh, methods, excuse me, um, require a little bit more time. When we remove a helmet, um, we want to remove the face mask, the chin piece, um, the pads around, place our fingers on both sides, slowly slide the helmet off as we do that. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you.